So I think there is a uh, certain amount of, or an, or an element of, of risk in putting out kind of a video like this that is so timely and current. And obviously this is still kind of a breaking and emerging thing. Um, I don't want this to be something that kind of gets other threat researchers or other analysts kind of like in a tizzy. I don't want anyone to be upset or going crazy. Like uh, all of the stuff that I'm going to end up sharing in this video is public, right? And uh, it, I care specifically much more about the the tech technology, the trade craft, the technical analysis, um, the, the techniques that they're using kind of on the keyboard and stuff like that when we're looking at bad guys, you're looking at hackers and threat actors. Um, what I do want is for this video to be all about education and bringing this into the spotlight and showcasing it and raising awareness because I think that we're doing this sort of stuff, threat research, analysis, threat intel. Um, it's so that we can better the community, right? So that everyone else is kind of in the know and aware of this stuff. So... Again, this will be kind of just showcasing technology and, and what we're seeing. Um, I will note, of course, that, look, uh, disclaimer, I don't know all the things. And if I misspeak or if I'm wrong, that's totally cool. I hope, fingers crossed, please be cool with that. Uh, let me know in the comments, share. And obviously, as I said, this is sort of an ongoing thing and that it's still kind of developing. So... Uh, maybe the stuff that I end up showcasing will be out of date and not applicable in the next day or whenever you happen to watch this video or as new things develop. And obviously, if you see anything new or interesting or peculiar, um, please do share. There's an email in the description. Uh, you can hit me up anywhere online, Discord, Twitter, LinkedIn, blah, blah, blah. You know, you can find me. It's pretty easy to cyber stalk me. Uh, and <laughs> there's the risk again, right? So anyway... Enough of me blabbering, I know that was a two minute introduction that was not necessary, but this video, I want to showcase some of the post-exploitation from some of the Microsoft Exchange, proxy logon, Hafnium, Incident, Skyfall, etc. Um, so I, I just want to be showcasing the technology and showcase the education piece of, of that and some of the post-exploitation stuff that we're kind of uh, tracking. Uh, or at least what we've seen so far. So I'll get to my computer screen here and we'll take a gander. Uh, I have my gist, my GitHub gist page open and available, and I'm going to be kind of pouring and scrolling through here. So this is, as I mentioned, off the tails of the Microsoft Exchange kind of vulnerability that came out and has been being exploited and is still kind of actively uh, being exploited. So recently, uh, I, I just updated this one here for the China Chopper web shell. So if you're interested in some of this other stuff, or if I'm not laying out the background and the backdrop or setting the stage properly here, uh, the exploitation of these Microsoft Exchange servers comes with a sort of indicator of compromise, right? The IOCs and that you might find web shells or ASPX web shells in a specific file location, either through kind of the default installation of Microsoft Exchange or kind of shown through in like an IIS web route here. Now, when this broke, when this went down, like there were practically no antivirus or EDR programs or solutions that would stop this because, oh, web files in the web root directory, that sounds totally normal. No cause for concern or suspicion. Keep in mind, it's the contents of this web files that is kind of spooky and sketchy. So I, I will showcase this, and I've done plenty of work with this kind of through my own day job. So if you're interested, you can certainly dig up some other stuff in case I don't explain this all that well. But I just updated this with some of the other recent findings that we've seen here. So tons and tons of stuff, right? But the ASPX shells that have that China Chopper structure. Um, and actually, let me Google that. China Chopper to give a little bit more color behind that, right? Uh, this is an article that FireEye put out back in 2013. So like, this is a known thing. And some of you that play Capture the Flag or some of you that are kind of into the scene, look, you know, it's the equivalent of like a PHP one-liner thing where you just fire up and pass in system with an HTTP argument, like a get variable or a post variable. It's literally the exact same idea and that, hey, you just end up passing along a variable or kind of an HTTP get parameter argument, we're calling it a key or a password because obviously you or the attacker would need to know what that the name of that key or that variable happens to be. And that can sort of allow for some mental gap as only the people that know that password will be able to execute code there. But that's it. There's it in ASPX, uh, and they have a rendition in PHP. This also has a lot of other functionality, and I, I think some, like a whole front end for how you can do things with this. That's what a lot of this 
stuff that FireEye was showcasing here, but it boils down to just that syntax of like, yo, take in a variable from the HTTP request and execute it. Like it's, it's a command, you're operating from the command line, et cetera, et cetera. Do they have the syntax for the PHP one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's ASPX, which we're what we are seeing. And of course, PHP, as you've seen it, like an eval or an exec pass through system, etc. But just an HTTP variable. That's kind of all that it boils down to. Okay, that was enough of that backdrop. Sorry. Um, but we're seeing all of these different potential web shells. And we try to create a list of them because a lot of them tend up being just random, like, a through Z, uppercase, lowercase, with some digits in there. Or some of them, and I, we tend to call that like a, a random file name, but some of them also tend to be static, like a T or an error page, or some as, as ballsy to say shell, <laughs> load, outlook, en, et cetera, et cetera, HTTP proxy, support with the zero to be leet. Uh, and you can see the syntax here that just is doing a weird job and like not showing. But of course, you can see that key or what it ends up moving through. Some of these I think are really interesting because there are a few cases where you'll see, oh, an, an, at least an effort or attempt to maybe do some evasion where you concatenate the strings for the word unsafe as if that's going to get through some signature detection. Maybe it does. Maybe it will. I, again, do not know. Uh, other ones are, uh, are also interesting where they're like getting a whole request object out and like saving a file out of it. I do see some that um, I think are just using like another PowerShell request or payload. Um, let me pull it down. I think it's down here below, but that's kind of the normal one that NO9, et cetera. Although we've seen other variations of it and you can see some of the static ones like orange or bingo or ananas. <laughs> Where's the other neat stuff? There it is, there it is, there it is. So eval system text encoding UTF-8 get string from base64. So you base64 encode some of these and it's like a whole random hash for that variable or that HTTP request. One of these, I'm not exactly positive. It's like a a a a a a a Maybe there's just, maybe they're making a mess. Who knows? Um, and some of them are also peculiar. I think this HTTP slash F like isn't a thing. Obviously, checking out the etc. host file for the victims for the target compromised machines. There is no domain F, and there isn't just one on the internet, right? I'm pretty sure it's just to cram it into the external URL, which was that field in the OAB directory configuration thing to look like a URL. But then, because this is going to end up being rendered as ASPX, just jam in the script tag here, because that's actually what's going to be end up being executed server side. Anyway. Enough backdrop, we're like 10 minutes in the video and we haven't even gotten anything interesting. So, this is the web shell. That means the attackers have remote code execution, they have access and availability to run commands and operate on that machine. Boom. This thing affected like all versions of Microsoft Exchange, all of those servers are typically publicly exposed to the internet, bad, and... They're people are just kind of spraying and praying. The bad guys are just like, hey, man, let's whack the whole internet with this thing. Let's see what falls out. So hence the scramble, hence the concern. And, and maybe I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm hyping this thing up too much, but we kind of thought it was a big deal. It was kind of a bad thing. So now, and this is breaking, right? So this has gone on for the past week and a little bit earlier when it's all started to kind of fall through. So maybe I'm late on getting this video up. But now we're seeing post-exploitation. Now we're seeing the techniques and tradecraft that follow this. So what is going to go down? What are the hackers going to do? Are they going to drop ransomware? Are they just going to exfiltrate data? Are they going to like, I don't know, steal things to sell out on the dark web? Spooky wooky. Are they going to use a crypto coin miner? Like just start harvesting Bitcoins, become part of a botnet. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, let's get to one of the kind of indicators of a compromise, right? We saw the web shell, but now what commands are the attackers going to run on that web shell? So I have this one that I want to uh, bring us down the rabbit hole with, and I call this file stage zero.cmd. So catting this out to take a look at what we got here. This was just one of the logs, one of the things that we, we had seen that was detected. I think Defender actually ended up seeing this and like quarant or no, they removed it. But uh, CMD, 
run on the command prompt, right? Slash C. So we run one command in line, passed in as arguments, and we kickstart PowerShell. PowerShell tack EP for execution policy, where we bypass the execution policy. And tack E for enc or enc or encoded, so you can pass in an encoded command. And it's base64 encoded, right? So we can see all this gobbledygook, all this nonsense, all this techno jargon. It's base64. So we can pretty easily just go ahead and decode that, right? That's that's what base64 just lets us do. So I will go ahead and cat, or excuse me, I'll echo that out. Copy and paste that. And I will pipe it to a base64 tack D or minus D. So we can decode. Ah, and this is what came out. So IEX or invoke expression, right? And invoke expression will execute code. It's essentially an eval statement, right? The argument or the string that is passed to it will run as if it were a PowerShell syntax and command. Now we create a new object net.web client so we can access the internet and we download a string present at this location, HTTP, p.est09, uh, I'm gonna call it pest online, even though obviously it's not, that's not what that says, um, but that's just kind of an easy thing to, to name that with. We can address that problem. And it goes to p with an HTTP variable e, <laughs> included as a, as a little get variable there, the question mark. So what is that thing? We kind of want to know, hey, what's, what is that? What is on that page? Does that page still exist? So I'm going to go ahead and copy that syntax and I will simply try to see if that actually still exists. No. Okay. So it, it, it wasn't ending up being a thing, at least not right now. Um, I'll bring this to you because I will lay the foundation in that we went ahead and contacted the owners of, of that. We tried to like some who is. We would try some Shodan to get an idea as to what this thing is. It was a DigitalOcean IP address, as I'm sure you're seeing a trend in uh, the DigitalOcean, I don't know, cloud provider that that this has been this hacker's use. Uh, they're, they're one of choice. And I think Namecheap was the one that had the domain. So we notified them and, and they stopped it. They pulled it down from what I can see now. But I did save the original payload and the tech that came from it. So I want to showcase some of that. Now, again, all of this is present here on my GitHub gist. You can see, yo, know, I made these a couple of days ago when I just tried to store all this and make it visible and, and, and accessible to other people. So this is the PS online or, or pest online, right? We'll call it and their stage one. Now, if we go check this out, there's a lot here. I don't know if you can see that horizontal bar, but boom, <laughs> plenty of stuff. So let me grab that syntax and I will simply call that, what do we want to call that? Stage one, right? Stage one.ps1. We'll slap it in here. And of course it starts with an invoke expression. Now let me cat this because it might be a little bit easier to see. It's just a wall of more base 64. However, it's going to end up creating this as a memory stream, taking that base64, decoding it, and also deflating it with some compression algorithm. Normally you'll see like gzip being used to decompress some stuff, uh, deflate, uh, that's another kind of variation, right? And obviously at the very, very end, we'll go ahead and decompress it and read to the very, very end of it, and it'll execute that because of the invoke expression at the very, very top. So this structure is very normal for a another PowerShell stager. Uh, question is, okay, what is actually in this code? Because we're using invoke expression, we know at the very end of the day, this is gonna end up translating out to PowerShell syntax, more PowerShell code. Well, we wanna know what that is. So. If we were to try and like defang this, uh, sure, we could grab this base64 syntax all on its own. We could decode it. We could deflate it with, I guess, I think Zlib, right? Maybe I'm wrong in that. Yell at me if I'm not, if I am. Uh, and then we could just do it kind of ourselves. Or because it's PowerShell syntax, we can just let PowerShell decode it. As long as we are certain we have removed that invoke expression so we don't actually execute this, so we don't run it on our own system. So I will copy all this and 
I'm going to fire it up. Oh, I think I need a shift control. Z. And I think I'll throw it in PowerShell, right? So if I'm running this in PowerShell on Linux, I don't exactly know, obviously because we're just decoding this data. If we were to actually end up running something, then it, if it uses like Windows internals or Windows stuff, and it will just fail. That's kind of the, the gamble, the, the dice roll that you do when you try and run some of the stuff on in PowerShell on Linux. So also have a Windows VM kind of prepared and ready for you. But in this case, it should totally be fine. So let me paste all this in. You can see I have removed my invoke expression. We're just starting with this object here. So I just want to see what this returns. I want to see what comes out of this. I'll hit enter. And there we go. Now we have more code and more syntax. And looks like this is actually pretty telling. So I will grab this. Oh, and I actually didn't finish. I, I didn't get to the very, very top here. There we go, there it is. Copy that. And let's just get another terminal over here because we'll keep PowerShell open up there. I don't think I have a profile set up to change that to blue, but let's get what is it, stage two now? Slap that in. And now we're seeing some more new interesting things. We start with some enumeration. The bad guys are gonna wanna know what is the computer that they landed on. They retrieve the Mac address with a get Mac. Is that something that's defined in here? No. Oh, that looks like a CMD command. Looks like an old school command. Does that uh, actually work? Fire up my Windows VM. Uh, so now I just hopped over to a Windows virtual machine, right? I have Windows Terminal open, but it started me off in PowerShell. I want to get into CMD because that could end up being... Oh, I don't think I have the stinking shared clipboard on in this. Advanced. Oh. I had to reset this VM some time ago because it... Uh, there we go. It was just not behaving with like Windows updates or whatever. Uh, let's run this. Okay, and there we get... Uh, a MAC address. So that can be poured in. We skip the first line, convert from CSV, get the header MAC, and expand on that MAC. So it just grabs the MAC address. That's all that that variable is going to end up doing. Then we try, oops, sorry, bumping around, if global PS exec can be executed. EXE flag is flice. <laughs> I don't even know how to pronounce that. Um, I think that's just checking if PS exec is a thing. I'm not a thousand percent positive. There's nothing malicious in that. So let's just kind of go do it. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I'll exit out of CMD and get us back into PowerShell. And yeah, paste it anyway. Who cares? I'm just kidding. You should care. Okay. Looks like that's okay. It does return that object. And is exe flag set? No, it is true. It is not Flace, unless Flace is already defined, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Name, of course, will still be a thing. Okay. Then we get the date. We store it in DT as a variable. Uh, the path is going to end up being our environment variable for the temporary location, and it puts it in ccc.log. Okay. Flag as to whether or not that exists, because we're just testing the path, that will go ahead and, and verify, hey, does that file exist already and determine it. Let's try to run some of those. Now, of course, DT is our current date. And what else did we just choose? Path, yep. Path should have evaluated out fully to my temporary directory, which it does. And we called it like what, flag? And that is false because it does not yet exist. Okay, so let's get back to this here. Permit looks like it's going to end up checking the current identity and checking if it is an administrator, right? So if it is in an administrator role, the key that builds out is going to be the MAC address, which we've just determined AV, which it doesn't look like, I don't, I don't think it ended up getting version. Did I miss some of the code here? Get WMI object, gets the version and the architecture for the 32-bit or 64-bit. Oh, and the domain and user and PowerShell presence. There's a lot. Okay, okay. 
we could explore this in the gist again, and I have that code still publicly available. So let me just verify that. Get back to our Firefox here. And this should be what we called stager02. Okay, no, and that's the exact same syntax. I didn't see that AV variable be defined or used yet. Huh. That's fine. Okay. Then if we do not have our logging set up, we will create it. And if we are an administrator, seemingly from permit variable up here, we'll go ahead and do the same PowerShell download cradle for IEX invoke expression, now downloading from cdn.chatcdn.net with p high or hig set to the date. Odd. DT is set to date. Okay. And the text that returns from it, it retrieves as bytes. Base64 decodes it and then sets up a service. Right? No, 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 a scheduled task. So SC exec is going to be argument slash create running as user system, uh, configuration with the minute. For every 45 minutes, we will run a task name winnet, W-I-N-N-E-T, slash T-R, uh, and that syntax and code will be PowerShell running the code that it had previously downloaded from cdn.chatcdn.com. Of course, bypassing it and encoding it, and slash F. Ah, and then it, go ahead and, when it goes ahead and creates it. So slash file path uh, with the scheduled task, creating that scheduled task. Now, that is persistence, right? So every 45 minutes, we'll go ahead and run something as a system user, and it's going to be variable on what is returned from this domain. And the HIG variable isn't actually set to anything. It's just including it in the it's just including the date time like in the request, but it's not being used as a variable. It's not being set equal to anything. So maybe they're just using that to keep track of the timing as to when they're seeing these responses. And of course, every 45 minutes, um, well, then they don't even need to run this request every 45 minutes. They've just downloaded that persistent code from that location. Ah, okay. Otherwise, if it's not an administrator, it will download, again, from cdn.chatcdn.net, low as the argument and DT being the date one more time. But now they aren't using that slash RU or the run user as system because it's just going to end up running in the current context of the current user. So it's not an administrator and cannot use that system level. There we go. We should go ahead and explore what that uh, location is. That's CDN, chat, CDN. Schedule task run for win it, task name, win it, and that's its persistence that it has kickstarted and is now in action executing every 45 minutes. We should go find out what that is. We sleep for a random amount of time. We try to get a WMI object for the processes that are running, select string pattern for download string. So it looks like it's trying to find its own coding there if run dot length is less than zero so if it actually found a result and it has not been executed it creates this onps variable which is a argument again to cmd.exe slash c running powershell no profile window format is hidden execution policy bypass and tax c for the command that we want to run and it's going to run another download cradle downloading from that ip address <laughs> with an update.png and the key that it has uncovered from all of our MAC address and information, everything that it already kind of extracted with its own enumeration. Ah, okay. And then it will execute that ONPS. And otherwise it tries to kill PID. Was PID ever defined? Or is that just a PowerShell thing? There's no way that's just a PowerShell thing, is it? PID. Oh, today I learned, right? TIL. That's why we do this, ladies and gentlemen. So 
let's go let's go see if this thing is actually exists cdn uh that chat cdn.net slash p hig or high high and low mm. so that one does exist <laughs> When we were to supply low, I think we get, are these the exact same? Let's try and redirect that out to HIG and let's redirect that to low and I'm not including the date in here. I don't know if it will actually make any difference, but can I cat HIG? That is that. Now what about, uh, low if i diff hig and low they're the exact same file shaji 56 um hig and low yeah literally the exact same so no difference whether or not you are an administrator or not in that persistence now what is that going to end up doing right let's go ahead and find out um we have that syntax once again using that powershell setup invoke expression uh, deflate string from base 64. Let's get everything other than that invoke expression and let's bring down our PowerShell prompt from before. Slap that in. And now we have this thing. Okay. Uh, goodness. Is this thing like fully reversed? This is disgusting. <laughs> Let's save that and let's call that um, persistence.ps1. Slap all that in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Invoke expression. Joining regular expressions that match that, which is totally in reverse. Kill that thing. This whole thing is reversed. You can see like start process over and over again. Does this actually ever reverse it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right to left. All right, so rather than running invoke expression on this one more time, let's be dangerous. Nerf that. I'm removing the, I'm removing the uh, parentheses that was following it. So now I can try to just slap this into PowerShell one more time. Here we go. There we go. And this is still kind of really messy to read. Is this the exact same code? I see that get Mac flag in there. Um, subl decoded persistence.ps1. Oh gosh, this is gross. They're going to end up using semicolons though because it's all one line. So what we can do... Are they going to end up using semicolons? What the F? You know what? Let's split on the plus sign and then make it a new line plus sign so it's a little bit more readable. <laughs> Not that that's really readable whatsoever, but this is the exact same setup. They're getting the MAC address again. They're setting the EX, exe flag. What is this? What is this? X, W, H though. That I'm sure is being replaced. Yeah, it totally is. Because that's going to end up being the prefix for a variable. You can see that B code that we saw earlier. There's that chat one more time, exactly. That chat CDN domain. And all this replacing is going to end up actually happening. So, you know what? Let's. This needs to be ran again this isn't actually going to be executed actually actually be super duper careful with this one i see it right here i see it at the very very end it's piped into an ampersand with ps home index 4 and ps home index 30 and an x that should be iex let me let me let me check this out let's grab the syntax let's get over to our windows virtual machine and I'll slap this in. <laughs> Thanks, Windows. I really appreciate that. So PS Home, this is a this is a well known trick. Um, PS Home, let's get this variable. You can see here. PS Home index 
four. Like there's the original string that looks pretty benign. It's just where your, your PowerShell home is going to end up living and existing. But PS Home Index 4 is an I. And check it out. PS Home Index 30 is an E. So when you concatenate that all together, you get the value IEX. And I love that Windows actually knew that. Like AMSI probably was like, nah, nah, nah. So don't let that execute. <laughs> because that's going to actually run it. Uh, that is a known trick. At the very, very end, they'll try and hide the IEX by wrapping it in other variables and extracting an individual index out of that. So if we were to go ahead and get um, replacing this XWH, right? Uh, you know what? I'm pretty sure it'll end up just spitting it all out as a, with a dollar sign. XWH has got to end up being a dollar sign. So let's remove that IEX and of course, trust in ourselves, slap it into PowerShell, run that code. And look, this is literally the exact same syntax. Let's set that to PowerShell. It's doing the exact same thing, grabbing the MAC address, expand, try, except it doesn't have new lines, which is horrific and hard to read it doesn't even have it doesn't even have semicolons so what's going on but there's that again same ip address update.png yep 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 setting persistence with win it like forcing that persistence over and over and over again dirty okay okay i think that's i think that's all that we're going to end up getting out of that. We we still have more that we should kind of review and look at. But before I drive onward, I do want to note that if we were to Google around and try and research some of this structure, like if I were to, I don't know if I'll actually get the hit doing it. I'll go to Google just to go here, see if it's around. No, that might be too obscure. CCC.log. I'm going to I'm going to weird places on the internet right now. I will I will okay. Let's cut to the chase. This is a known thing. Like this syntax has actually been seen around. I guess 2019 Carbon Black put this out. Um, thanks Ryan Murphy. Kudos to you. This dives into a little bit more like malware analysis and like actually showcasing the whole storyline. So <laughs> kudos to you. Much better than me. But take a look. Uh, they do this exact same setup where it's obviously going to end up being another PowerShell download cradle. But once it pulls itself down, once this PowerShell payload and that download cradle runs, you end up getting some other obfuscated stuff that eventually turns into the exact same syntax that we've seen thus far. IEX for string Mac, getting the Mac address, doing this, literally using ccc.log, using the exact same log file, the exact same code and techniques, creating, where is it, win it? Yep, it's win it once again, that persistence. Downloading from chat.cdn.net. Downloading from a different IP address here, but slash update. So this is only one route, obviously, like this is only one of the command and control post exploitation techniques that we've seen thus far coming out of the Microsoft Exchange incident. But this apparently is already a known thing. Um, there is research on that from, from two years ago. So I can uh, link this in the description if you have any interest in reading along on that. But we thought that was, mm, mm, what is this? We, we have apparently already known about this in, in our world. So all right. wanted to showcase that and, uh, and I'll share that with you all as well. You might remember ladies and gentlemen, that we are not yet finished in what we could do with this stage two file because we checked out cdn.chatcdn.net, but there was one more IP address. There was one more location that we could end up going right down here when it tried to execute code coming from this IP address, 188.166.162.201 update.png. It'll include a key, and I don't know if I need to supply that right now, uh, let's see if we actually get a response without it. And of course, like classic, right? We've seen it before. Trying to smuggle PowerShell code inside of a PNG file. Look, it's not a PNG file. 
Let's curl this down. Let's see if it still exists. And it does. <laughs> so more dirty work in here. Um, let me actually save this copy of, what is that? Stage 3.ps1. Now I have this still stored and saved in a GitHub gist. Scrolling back, uh, this was the update.png.ps1. And this is a large file. So if we were to view the full file, um, I'm just going to copy and, and save this as well. Oh, we'll save that as other stage three dot PS1. That it did include a key when we passed it along. Uh, so if I actually check out stage three, what the heck? Did curl not like actually output that for me? I curl's output is tack O, isn't it? Yeah, cause W get does the tack capital O. Tack lowercase O for curl. Stage three dot PS one. What's going on? We just saw that output. It's right here. The the file is huge. Granted, there's a lot of base sixty four. Sorry, sorry. I know this is really painful on human being eyeballs. <laughs> Look at this. Look at how far my scroll bar is right now. I mean, it got it. No, 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 no. That's that's actually from Hig. Shoot. You can see the previous commands. That was that was from a, an earlier one. Maybe for the sake of our own sanity, we should, yeah, you know what, let's stop, let's stop. Let's just get the one from the gist uh, and we'll use that other stage three dot PS1. Good enough. So what do we got here? Ladies and gentlemen, same exact setup, ginormous line. Let me actually check that out. LSAC LA, other stage three. This is two and a half megs. Mm -hmm. Two and a half megabytes of base 64 compressed data. So if we were to see all of this there's a deflate stream all of the noise and the nonsense going to the very very end there's nothing else in this so as usual let's nerf that invoke expression copy that syntax and let powershell do the magic for us um i'm gonna end up slapping this all in and it might take a long time you know what that was a horrendous idea <laughs> At least we look like a real hacker. Now, where's my mask? Where's my, where's my Guy Fox mask? We try to have fun here on this channel. So if any of you guys, they're like real professionals are watching this video and we got to this point, look, I'm sorry. <laughs> I started off the video all like cool and somber and now I'm just goofing off. All right, I'll pause the video recording and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to when this is done. I should have just ran this as a script. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, hi. Uh, I, I tried to kill PowerShell to stop that from happening. Uh, it didn't work, <laughs> apparently. So I just uh, ran it and redirected it out to a, a stage four and I opened that up. So before I dive in though, let me take a look at this. This stage four is now uncompressed, right? Decompressed, and we got three megs. So let's take a look at that guy. Sublime text is like, <laughs> I'm trying to trying to catch up with you here, John. Um, but this, this one, I think is neat, and I do want to showcase this to you. So take a look at that first line, first of all. Really wonky, really messy, and this is ginormous. I don't know if you can see my horizontal scroll bar down at the very, very bottom of the screen, but there's a lot going on, and it takes a long, long time to get to the very end of that line. Uh, let me table that for the moment, but scrolling down, we can see other PowerShell syntax that might be continuing on from the very end of that line, um, but following that, we create this function. Oh, sorry. I'll scroll down here. DHWE kid. Um, it creates some bytes and variables and all these things here. Uh, that some of this is obfuscated, right? And some of it is not, which was weird to me. Like you can see these functions here. New 
new packet SMB2 session setup request. And it's like creating SMB packets. Um, make SMB1 trans2 exploit packet. I think some of this actually comes from Empire, and I might be wrong in that, but I'm, when we were, we were kind of hunting around Googling as to WTF is this thing, we, I thought we saw some uh, semblances there. But, uh, and some of them have like different, completely random uh, conventions for how they're naming their functions. Some of them are like a more PowerShell like verb noun set up with capitalization. Although some of them have like the all lowercase snake case um, that we just saw earlier. And it's just kind of weird. So as I was scrolling through here, and there's a lot, right? There's about three megabytes of all this information. A lot of it is um, those function names that we saw for SMB. You can see invoke SMB, C, maybe that's channel. Uh, and I won't end up going through a, a huge analysis on this the way that it stands right now. But I'm going to keep cruising through because maybe you might have noticed the same thing that I noticed that I thought was incredibly weird and incredibly strange. So first of all, uh, just to make our analysis somewhat easier and sane, and this is what I ended up doing while I was going through it in real time, is that I would try to look for all these function names. Um, so I'd look for function dot whatever, and I would just hit find all, so I'd have them all selected, and I'd copy them out and bring them into a new file. So that way I could look for all the function names. I guess I'll... Uh, Make some of these capital function. Oh, so it's not going to give me that syntax? Whatever. Oh, it's because of these curly braces. Um, but this at least gave us a, a decent idea as to what all this code was doing. Now, as I scroll down here, some of these are very, very strange. I don't know if you see this KDHSD hyphen. There's a string and a comma and then random base64 all the way at the end. And then it just adds an if statement way off to the side. That didn't make any sense to me. And it's, it wasn't just that one. There were multiple. We're make SMB2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Function main, that would be worthwhile to take a look at. Another new tack P, random base 64. So looking through that, that kind of tipped me off initially. But as I was continuing to scroll through here and look for interesting things, like I think we saw like a what? A, a dump hashes. Yeah, there's a function called dump hashes, which is sus. Um, I think there were some other odd ones, but keep an eye out for this weird setup where you have these uh, single quotes and commas and then other random base64 data that makes no sense. That's not normal PowerShell syntax. So eventually we were like, st I was staring at this whole big long line at the top here because it makes no sense as to why that's all there. So I, I, I turn off word wrap, and now we have this humongous chunk of all of these numbers. But I was like, that's not hex. That's not decimal ASCII values. That's not octal. There's no representation of that that makes sense when you're looking at that many digits. And eventually I got down to the very, very bottom of those numbers in their pattern there. And I saw this tack F and I thought like, huh, what does that do? Is that a thing in PowerShell? Following that is a lot of base 64, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And scrolling down more and more and more, I, I thought like, okay, let me take all of the base 64 that I see. But even some of that base 64 has these commas and ending strings here. We're like one of these is just a, a the letter B. <laughs> Great. That's helpful. So I took all this and I uh, ended up taking all of those commas and replacing them with a new line. Uh, did that actually work? Maybe not. A bad example. Yeah, whatever. Forgive me. Praying to the demo gods always fails. Um, Anyway, the point that I came to when I was looking at just that base 64 as if that was being used, I, I thought it was really, really weird. I thought, is that actual syntax in PowerShell where you just randomly use tack F? So I thought, let's take this string, including the base 64, and let's see if we could actually get anything out of it. Um, so I, I brought it over to Windows 10 PowerShell and tried to just paste it in. Yep. 
do it. Oh God, why did I, why did I stink in? <laughs> Eventually I, I realized I hit this error. It says error formatting a string index zero based must be greater than or equal to zero and less than the size of the argument list. And I thought like, wait a second, error formatting a string? Is that TAC F literally doing a, a, like an F string, like in Python equivalent, a format string? And then I realized like, oh, this must be doing some F string. Because looking at all these, that makes sense syntactically with the numbers and the curly braces. And I was trying to find like, oh, is there a uh, curly brace zero? Which it looks like there is, right? I don't know if you could see that down there just by my face. Is there a curly brace one? Yep. Two? Yep. Three? Yep. Okay, so it was piecing it all together, but what was the largest number in here? Is there... Like between all the base 64 string that we saw just underneath it, how much is that? Is that th there's no way there's 3,000 commas separated there as arguments to a format string. Like I see numbers up to 2679. Uh, I think I saw some 3,000 somewhere. Yeah, 3,004. But then I had this epiphany and I realized the entire PowerShell script itself is being used as a format string. All of the different chunks and all the different portions that we are randomly seeing where you're starting to add in parameters and create variables, but then suddenly have a random string with a comma and then base 64 in the middle, that's impossible in PowerShell syntax. That's literally not how it will tokenize and run. So then I realized this is a giant puzzle where they're reorganizing, reordering, and rearranging all the pieces of the script and then using that as their final payload. So that kind of blew my mind and I thought it was really kind of neat. So at the very, very top, here's a crap ton of numbers. It's all passed with TAC F to create a format string and the entire PowerShell script is a format string. <laughs> Isn't that so cool? Obviously horrific and malicious and nefarious and bad, but so cool. <laughs> now, here's the kicker, right? Of course, this is all going to end up being a string. Does it get executed? Where in this giant glob of three megabytes of PowerShell creating over, what is that? What is that? How many lines is that? 10,269 lines of code. Where is the IEX? Where is the invoke expression? Is it going to very dangerously throw it in there somewhere and I have to hunt it down? Well, no. Because all this string is going to be joined together in place, rearranged and reordered like those puzzle pieces. And at the very, very bottom, check this out. The exact same kind of tradecraft and style that you just saw previously, where it's piped into an ampersand to run it with env comspec indexing that out, joining it all together. I'll show you this. Let me take this real quick. I'll take that syntax, hop on over to my Windows PowerShell here, paste that in, IEX. Again, just another technique to index out individual letters from a known variable that will be constant and static on every single target, every single victim. Comspec should typically always be cmd.exe. Take index four, take index 15, take index 25, slap that all together as one string. Now you have crafted the alias to run invoke expression and your spooky, scary, evading antivirus and detection. Um, so now, so far in this video, we've seen two ways to do that. And obviously there are, there are many, many more. Just grab any kind of static known environment variable on the target, which should be the same across all targets and then cram it together. Smart, smarticle. So, with that said, now we know what to nerf. Now we know what to defang and remove from this. So if I take this stage four and just kill that IEX at the very, very end, now I could safely run that stage four and rearrange it, reorganize it, reorchestrate what this script would originally look like and we'll have the original string, the original script. So let me smartly do that with PowerShell this time. I'll run PowerShell stage four. And we'll redirect that out to stage five. Jeez, um. 
Let it go. Cool. All right. So now let's see if that exists and is relatively sane. And it is. This is much more readable and makes much more sense than the previous one. And you can see some kind of well-known other, other tricks where you just throw back ticks in for the PowerShell syntax because the back tick is the escape character in PowerShell. So normally you'll use a, a backslash N to create a new line in other programming languages or scripting languages or backslash T to create a tab. So rather than the backslash, PowerShell uses a back tick. But not only is PowerShell case insensitive where it doesn't care about the uh, capitalization or lowercase and uppercase letters. So you can make your messages look like straight up memes, <laughs> the SpongeBob meme. Uh, and you can just arbitrarily throw in back ticks wherever you want. Cause if it's not a valid escape character, PowerShell's be like, oh sure, I, I, just, I know what you mean. Yeah, you just want a regular A character. <laughs> but now you're again, evading antivirus or classic formulaic stupid signature detection just tricks just just stuff that bad guys are using uh and we do too right as red teamers pen testers threat emulation anyway you can see all of these functions now as they originally were some other techniques to replace information uh to get looks like shares getting SMB packets, like carving them out by hand or crafting them all, which is kind of neat. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking these are part of other C2 frameworks that have all been like, crammed in together. Again, now if we were to try and look for all the functions here, and we can do that, I won't actually pour through all of this because I think you get the gist and that those techniques they're using, replacing the back ticks, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of this is actually kind of like decently readable you know if we wanted to we could remove all those back ticks but some of them might actually be in different places but the the wodge wodge the replacements those techniques are, are are present how far are we going how many how many lines do we need to go in here oh here's a good one though before i go too far i did see this us getting versions right checking for the operating system, et cetera, et cetera. And as you scroll down you do see this giant chunk in yellow here and now we have inline C sharp code because PowerShell can do that, right? So PowerShell can create this multi-line string with that at symbol and it will have a ping castle scanners namespace. Create a specific class where we have a scan function or functionality here where it'll do some TCP client <laughs> and it'll try and connect to the argument that's passed in on port 445. Good old SMB, right? Network stream, et cetera, reading out responses, trying to determine how it responds with potential name pipes, et cetera. And I'm just going through this as a, a 10,000 foot view, kind of scrolling by, but you can see the functionality there. I'm more impressed and I think it's more cool that you are seeing that inline C sharp be able to be brought in and compiled on the fly. They're doing that with add type. And now add type does boil down to using um, the, the cfc.exe or the command line c sharp compiler uh same thing with ms build i believe so they all end up writing to disk momentarily and i think i've either either i've showcased that in a previous video or i have footage that i still need to upload for for showcasing that anyway that gives us the functionality and i do see some shell code also being included here this is all from base 64 so we could go ahead and like try and spit that out but it is non-printable characters, so I'm assuming it's shell code, and we might need to do some, like, SC debug or something. Oh, actually, there's some stuff in here. Let's run strings on that. Uh, scrolling back, scrolling back. Mmm. CMD slash E, netsh.exe to take the firewall, add some opening ports, <laughs> A, their own DNS that they might end up using, port proxy. Isn't that port? Is that port bending? Yeah. If you haven't, uh, I think that's a, that's a neat technique where you can like redirect one port to another one, even locally. So there's a port proxy syntax. Uh, scheduled tasks, of course. What do we have? Do we have Winit in there? No, no, no. It's called sync. Ah. And every 40 minutes, we'll have a scheduled tasks run that will sync. And what is that PowerShell syntax? I, I don't think I've actually gone down this road yet. Is that different from that one down there? I don't think it is. 
Let's try and echo that out. Pipe it to base 64. Nope. It's our good friend uh, Pest Online. <laughs> With 32. Oh, 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 wait a second. 32? What is this other one? The one at the very, very bottom. Is that going to be like 64? Is it checking the architecture? Oh, it might be. Let's try and get that in there. Oh, sorry. Echo. And I did just grab the bottom one, right? P64 Tech D. 64! <laughs> All about that architecture. All about that architecture. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. I... If we, actually, let's take the original one and redirect that out to like um, shell code. How about that? What is that? It's just data. We already ran strings on it, so I I think that genuinely is shell code. It's not going to be like its own binary or anything. Let's um let's get back to stage five. Now we have a local scan function where it looks like it'll take in IP addresses and genuinely scan them avoiding or is it including local IP addresses API IPFI I'm assuming that's going to get it's yep their their public IP address begin connect etc cetera, etc cetera. power dump is that a thing what is that hmm um load API this looks like the classic syntax to dynamically load in an assembly Power dump, is that a thing? Power dump. Ah, Empire. Imagine that, just as we said. Okay. Pulling in other Win32 APIs to get more power, more functionality. Pulling NTLM passwords. SID to key. String to key. I don't want to scroll through this forever because obviously this is a very, very long file and we've, we're already like, I think an hour into the video recording. So it will get registry keys though. I'm sure, I'm sure you might already like, look, if we are seeing just the functionality of Empire all in, smashed into one PowerShell script, then that makes sense. Dump hashes, here's the original source code for that. Plenty of stuff here. Sam Sam domains invoke my pass for dumb bread going bots and custom commands parameters. We could drill into that a little bit. See if that's known more syntax for itanium. I don't know what, Oh, those look like just internal stuff for DLLs maybe or loading in other functions. Mm, there's a lot. There's a lot right there. Let's cruise through that because I want to get to the, the finale or the good stuff here. I'm going to page down through a lot of these because this is getting to be kind of huge. Cannot su subtract subarray, add integers. Is it just data conversion stuff? Yeah, convert, convert. Uh, test memory range. See if it's valid memory. Write bytes to memory. Get delegate type. Aha. The classic. Enable SE debug privilege. <laughs> a lot of good spooky functionality in here. Windows Vista or 7 detected using a different API call. Here they're keeping track of what target the victim is, what operating system that is. We're getting the good stuff. I'm getting slowly, slowly, slowly to something more interesting. I know there's one last layer of the onion that I want to get us to. And then we can call it the end of the video. But I hope you had fun. Hope you had fun cruising through all this with me. Get command line functionality? No. Virtual protect invoke. Is it rewriting? Is it changing some stuff in memory? Random function name. So if you're, if you're curious, of course, I, I know I'm breezing through this. This is all on my GitHub gist. So you can take a look at that one if you'd like. Um, there's obviously a lot to unravel here, but this is kind of where we get to the good stuff in function main here. You'll end up checking the 
64 bit potentially. I know I didn't go bother to deobfuscate some of the stuff, um, but there's others in here. And here we go. I think. No. Where are these bytes coming from? Are those defined? These base 64 ones I do want to showcase, but I don't know if I already scrolled through them. If anything, I can uh, turn off word wrap and they will, or turn on word wrap and then they will be extremely visible. But, oh, look at this, look at this. <laughs> these are these are uh, Mimi Cat's commands. Sekarelsa, crypto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, here they are. Here are these bytes. So, checking out these bytes here. This is all base 64, of course, right? So we can echo and, and decode all that. So let me echo this one. Oh, how's my, how's my terminal doing? Okay, he figured it out. Base 64, tag D, and where did that one, what was that one called? Bytes 32, or DS bytes. Um, DES bytes, we'll call it. And let's check out what that is. That is an executable, 64-bit. Okay, let's get this 32 one, bytes 32. Let's echo all of that out to a base 64 minus D. My face is in the way. Just trust that I am redirecting that out to, um, what was that called? Just 32? Or uh, we'll call it 32. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Let's cat that 32, or no, 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 let's run file on our 32. And that is 32 bit, right? So our des bytes is 64 bit, and that 32 is 32 bit. Makes sense. Now, running strings on, let's go for the 64 bit one, you can take a gander because unfortunately, right, unfortunately, these are not. Uh, .NET compiled once. So I wouldn't be able to crack this open in DNSpy or ILSpy and kind of get an understanding for it. We can throw it into Ghidra uh, and maybe that's worth a try. I, I, I just installed Ghidra over on the Windows side, but I don't know how far I'll be able to drive into that. Uh, at this point though, we've reached the end of the tunnel where we have a more solid binary. So we can kick that over to... Um, kick that over to virus total or take it over to like reversing labs or Joe's sandbox analysis or any run, whatever, whatever, whatever. We can see if that lights up uh, any antivirus scanners. Let's, tr uh, now that we know these are DLLs though, let's move 32 to um, 32.dll and let's move the des bytes to 64.dll. Let me do a quick strings on them before I continue with the performance here. Obviously, a lot of the default boilerplate nonsense stuff. Let's try and trim that down by using strings tack n like eight or something. And let's see if that will kind of minimize the noise. No, <laughs> not, not really. But we should hopefully at least have a shorter list here now. So we see encrypt references, DLLs, uh, messages that are kind of included, particularly in the compilation here. Of course, the days of the week, as we always see. Um, I don't know what these really are. On, off, all size, true, extra full, natural, left to right, full, inner across. I thought that was kind of spooky. I do see SQLite references though. Um, and I all see these potential like data names or, or field names for like stuff that will be stored in SQLite. Um, like these NTLM passwords or LM password history, et cetera, et cetera. Timestamps, a lot of API potential function calls. And obviously we're just looking at strings, right? So it's not going to be super duper telling. We'll fire open it in Ghidra in just a moment, but uh, after we kick it to virus total and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you can see like straight up SQL syntax, create table, auto increment, delete from, update, table names. And it's definitely using a SQLite database for keeping track of stuff. Uh, random blob, zero blob, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Too many arguments. Is there something more damning here? Oh, here we go. Here we end up checking out some cryptography stuff. Bcrypt, encrypt, import key, and of course, 
a good old Mimi Cat string. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank I'm glad you could make it to the party, Mimi Cats. System flags. System flags. Text records. LSA. So that must be something for getting pouring things out of LSAS, maybe. And of course, bcrypt, encrypt, all these other functions. But look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Powercats.dll and reference to power. Oh, moving my face again. I get it all the time. Move reference to PowerShell reflective Mimi Cats. Um, <laughs> we're looking at strings, mind you, again. So it's, hey, it, this isn't a smoking gun or anything, but now that we have a little bit more of functionality or, or an idea as to what this thing might be doing, let's kick it off over to our good friend Virus Total and uh, see what we got. Here we go. Let's go to Virus Total. VirusTotal.com. Once the internet loads, I'm waiting on the entire internet to come back for me here. There we go. Let's uh, upload a file on, we had what? My X was the directory that we called it. So 32bit.dll, let's fire that one up. And 52 out of 70 engines detect this one. <laughs> and they're saying, yo, Mimi Cats, Mimi Cats, malware, malware, hack tool, Mimi Cats, Mimi Cats, Mimi Cats, Mimi Cats, Mimi Cats. Dude, it's bloody. There is some carnage on this virus total page right here. What does the community say? Yep, reflected Mimi Cats. Reflected Mimi Cats. This, this is the same person over and over again. <laughs> um, let's try and give it that 64 bit DLL. 54 out of 70 engines. Nice. Mimi Cats, Mimi Cats, Mimi Cats, Mimi Cats. <laughs> it could be a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. Mimi Cats wrap. Once again, Mimi Cats reflective all throughout the community. Oh, Florian again. Sweet, dude. Um, so it's bad. I think we can come to that conclusion. <laughs> uh, uh, from what I understand, and uh, let's see if we can actually throw it into Ghidra. Uh, I'll try and see if I can upload this. Uh, opt HTTP.server, yeah? What am, What is my IP address real quick? Let's get a IPAS. Ah, I have multiple screens. What am I right now locally? I am 17. Can I reach that from my Windows VM? Port 8000, please, please, please. Yeah, all right, cool, cool, cool. Let's download a 64-bit. Let's see if Chrome was cool with it. All right, nope, <laughs> I spoke too soon. Chrome doesn't like it. And Defender's probably going to whine on this thing too, obviously. They'll be like, no, it's Mimi Cats. What are you doing, John? <laughs> let's uh, let's see if we can get, let's see if we can get him to, to shut up real quick. Um, manage settings. Please stop, Defender. We have to... Uh, <laughs> Virus protection is turned off. You might want to turn that back on, bucko. How did you know? Let's uh, copy this and try and W it down. How about that? Let's get to the old desktop here. Let's uh, W get, because that's an alias in, uh, in PowerShell. Out file 64.dll. Fingers crossed, please. What's happening? <laughs> PowerShell is just hung up on the phone, dude. I have I have no output. Do I need to have that earlier? Like use basic parsing should be after? Basic parsing. What is happening? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> let's do a little let's do a little invoke web request. Invoke web request. Slap. What's happening? I'm going to have to pause the video because I'm just crumbling at a simple wget command, everybody. Give me a moment. Okay. I don't really know what happened. Not going to lie. <laughs> it just like didn't want to come back. So uh, 32, 32. Oh, sorry, my face is in the way. 
I just downloaded the files. Here they are on my desktop. Um, let's see if we can get Ghidra to open them. I am running Ghidra within Windows because Ghidra uh, seemingly to open a, Lin a Windows file within Linux, it doesn't have like the file system provider to like kind of know what it's doing. And I understand, you know, sometimes I don't know how to speak in another language either. Um, but I don't know. I, truthfully, I've never done this. I've never tried to run Ghidra on Windows, so I have no idea what's going to end up going through. Um, let's create a new project, see if we can get anything here. And uh, non-share project, we'll call it Ghidra in lowercase. Totally cool. And then let's control I before the internet yells at me that I get that wrong um, to try and explore some of these. Control I to open up a binary. Once again, no file system provider. If I drag it in, let's see if it'll figure that one out now. Yep, okay, cool. So I have seen that error come up before recently and someone commented on the video, uh, the last video where I was trying to use Ghidra and they're like, no, 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 John, John, no file system provider. It's just some strange thing that happens. If you can drag the file in, it, it does behave. So forgive me on that. I think I commented on the video like, please forgive me, internet. <laughs> I'm said, truly sorry. Uh, but let's see if Ghidra can uh, pull it together on this one. Taking a sweet time. Pause the video real quick. Okay, looks good. Pulled it in. See if we can analyze it. Again, I don't know where this is going to go, so this is me re op operating at the edge of my understanding. See if we can analyze it. But, I mean, if it's just going to end up being Mimi Cats, at the very least, we know, hey, it can try and dump passwords and things and credentials out of memory. Um, I don't know exactly what this will look like, but we could pour through it. There we go. Entry. And it tries to run based off the parameters here. If parameter is one, it'll call this thing, which calls other functions. And this is kind of hard to see. The, the, I know that I would need to increase the font and everything here. But it's all going to end up being stripped. Um, and all of the virus total stuff that we see does indicate that, yo, this is... Uh, and it's not like you can just scan it. It's not like you can just open the thing up in virus total and say, oh, it's bad. It says it's bad or it says it's good. I'm going to totally ignore it. Uh, you got to take that with a grain of salt. Obviously, exploring through it in Ghidra is something that you can and should do, even if it's just clicking around, trying to see what they do. Like all the functions here, like if we were to look for, hey, PowerShell reflects Mimi Cats. <laughs> there it goes. It's a function. What else do you do? Uh, check out the command line arguments. Try and allocate memory. Uh, what is this guy? Run the thing? Explore it. Fast calls here. Truthfully, I'm out of my element when we get to this point. I had a lot more fun with the PowerShell. And it, uh, when we get to the point where it's like, yo, we've got the binary and this lights up on some community threat intelligence stuff between virus total and all, I think that's enough to, to call it quits here. But opening up the 32-bit and opening up the 64-bit, um, files in Ghidra or examining them does kind of offer the insight like look these look these seem to be both 64-bit and 32-bit Mimi cats so those could be going to grab credentials and more information um, that has been one route in what we've been or I've been uncovering kind of pouring through exploring and, and you can see some of my other work if you google it around but uh, all of those other stages as we pour through them are available again through my gist github and uh, this has all been obviously released before so I don't want to be letting the cat out of the bag on anything or, or making anyone upset like it, it's okay we're trying to all get better we're all trying to get smarter and understand the the post exploitation that might go on or what's happening next year. So I've seen other occurrences where folks are reporting like, Hey, they're running net.exe commands to add and remove administrators in the exchange group, right? Obviously in the Microsoft exchange uh, incident, we're seeing registry commands like reg query, reg dump, reg save to pull down SAM databases or other information. We're seeing proc dump. Obviously now we're seeing Mimi cats to gather information, passwords, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's starting. It's still coming through. It's still, but we, we need to all come together, right? And I say this all too often that it takes a village. You know, we're all trying to share this in intelligence as we're gathering. So please don't hesitate to offer or join in the fight, join in the fun. Uh, if there's any IOCs that you might want to share or other things we can examine and analyze, analyze 
But I have repeatedly wanted to emphasize my disclaimer and that I'm not a thousand percent positive and I don't guarantee any of this, but I wanted to showcase it and drag us through some of that code because I thought it was cool, kind of neat. Um, I will say none of this goes to say, none of this goes to show or none of this says or means like, oh, this is Hafnium. No, I can't say that. We can't say that. We can't say uh, it is one specific actor or multiple or is it being re-exploited? We just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and I'm not going to pretend like I do. Uh, I don't want to be in speculation corner, especially when folks are like, is this country X, Y, Z? Is this attribution? Look, uh, it's bad. And we got to get the bad stuff away no matter who made it or what it is or where it came from. Like, get know, understand that it's evil and then stop the evil. So that's enough of my rant. That's enough of this video, but... Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I think we can tune out now. Uh, I really, really hope you enjoyed this video. I really hope you had some fun with some of the PowerShell stuff we were carving through. I hope it had some uh, real-world application to it and that, yes, this is an ongoing, growing story. Um, there's more to come. And again, maybe my analysis is totally wrong, but it, it was kind of fun to unravel and pour through those, those PowerShell onions there. When we're getting to stage five, to get into stage six with this Mimi Cats DLL that's loaded in, Wow. Um, there's more to do, though. So we're, we're not over yet. It's not over yet. So thanks so much for watching, everybody. If you enjoyed this video, please do press that like button. Please leave a comment below. It helps the kind of YouTube algorithm engagement stuff. So if you're willing to, please subscribe for more videos like this. I have a lot in the canon, and people have been sending me some great malware samples. So please do, please, please, please keep it up. Um, Please do send along any uh, malware samples that you are interested in or kind of want to take take me to take a look at. There's a link or there's e my email in the description. So please keep sending them along. It's very cool, very fun. We can keep growing this thing. So uh, before I go, before I forget, I do want to mention quick little uh, notion here. Yo, NomCon. NomCon is coming up. NomCon is happening this Friday. And I want to throw in this pitch before the end of the video uh, because I should have done it at the beginning, but then no one would actually watch the video. Look, if you haven't registered for NomCon, I'm hosting the game. My guys, my team, my friends, we're all putting this game on. We have over like 70 challenges like a ton of challenges for this weekend competition, 48 hours, uh, that f this coming Friday to this coming sa Sunday. Uh, we have some fantastic sponsors that are offering some sweet, sweet prizes. I and E has thrown in some incredible stuff. I think Red Bull's trying to get everyone drinks. It's so, so awesome. Uh, and we're gonna be showcasing some other neat challenges. This is all new stuff. We're gonna have a ton of fun. So please, please, please register. Come play, come hang out. ctf.nomcon.com. We'll see you this coming Friday. But we're going to have a blast, and uh, you'll see some challenges a lot like this, a lot like this uh, neat malware analysis stuff. So, Okay, that is the end of the video, everybody. Thanks so much for tolerating me. I hope you enjoyed this one. I love you. I'll see you in the next one, and uh, keep on the fight. We're, we're all here to, to learn and keep growing, so share it with the community. Thanks, everybody. I love you. Take care.